Hi, this is Paul. One of the coolest things about the meetups, which have, of course, because of the coronavirus, been suspended, at least the in-person ones, is the opportunity to learn for me. I often tell people at meetups, I don't really go to the meetups to speak too much. I do plenty of talking here on the internet, but I go to listen because what I get from the individuals, especially if a group is small enough like this, this group that we had in Bellflower, to hear people talk and have their experiences shared. People are amazing and people's stories are amazing. One of the individuals that came to this meetup said something which has really stuck in my head. The, the idea was basically that what theology does is marks, in a sense, the ceiling of a cultural limit that a culture may ascend to. Now, this seems completely opposite anything that the celebrity atheists will say. The celebrity atheists will say that that theology, well, maybe it's opposite, maybe it isn't. Theology is a limitation. And maybe that's exactly what I'm saying. Again, these, these videos are rough drafts on my part, I think, while I sit. And, but their assertion is that if you get rid of theology, that somehow the culture will be able to rise and arise and transcend and the world will improve and things will be great and everything will be wonderful. The assertion of this individual who was very much in the Jordan Peterson line of things, had given up the faith and had found Jordan Peterson and Jordan Peterson got this individual thinking he doesn't go to church um, it was, he came with a friend, uh, Joseph, who had been watching my videos, but, but talked about, you know, what, what if, what if in fact the, the forerunners of, let's say cultural ascension are actually the, well, as it wouldn't be too different from Jordan Peterson, the artists and the poets and the theologians and the people who are talking and thinking about God. What if they were actually the ones who are doing the scaling and then it's the scientists who come along and can think behind them? I thought that was a, a fresh and startling idea for me. And again, it might not be a new idea and it might not even be a new idea to me, but it struck me in a very different way. And so... I, I've been thinking about that and that, that, that one's theology comprises the limits of one's culture. And then I found the idea again towards the end of Ross Douthat's book, The Decadent Society. I, I had seen that Douthat had put out this book. The title didn't grab me at all. And then Alan Jacobs had sent out a tweet with a on Twitter, he often sends out just these tiny little things that he writes on his Snakes and Ladders blog. And I read that. And when I read that, I thought, oh, I've got to read this book. And so, of course, I ordered the book. Now, and I've done a lot of thinking about, well, what do we mean by decadent? Because as as, as Douthat makes the point, well, uh, a chocolate cake can be decadent, decadent in a good way. But yet decadent has a has a moral valence about it that is is not flattering. Uh, he Douthat did an interview, again, a viewer sent this to me, with um, Albert Moeller, who is the president of a Baptist seminary. He's one of these, not so young anymore, but uh, restless and reformed um, Baptists who, have, who have, have gone over to a certain form of Calvinism. And on his podcast, he interviewed Douthat, and, and Moeller connected decadent with decline, which which is fair, but decadent comes from the word decay. It's the decaying society. And um, I think I think decaying is better than declining because in, in many ways Douthat makes the point that the decadent society is a society that's in a sense frozen. It's an arrested state of decay, sort of like if you visit Bodhi over in the Eastern Sierra, which is a fun trip over by Mono Lake. If you, you know, Bodie is very popular state park, and the 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 California state parks people will say it's maintained in a state of arrested decay, and and perhaps Bodie, 
uh, Douthat doesn't mention the, I'm getting used to saying his name right, Douthat doesn't name it, but, but in a sense, Bodhi, the ghost town of Bodhi, which was a silver mining town in, in the eastern Sierra, could perhaps be an image for what Douthat is saying. And, 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 and decay, decadence is, is perhaps, or decay, decadence is sort of like porn in, in a lot of different ways. Um, can you define it? Uh, you know it when you see it, and it's it's sort of a a gestalty relevance realization experience for me, and and it's sort of like you can't see the wind, and of course I'm borrowing on John chapter three here. You can't see the wind; you only see its effects. You don't know where it comes from or where it's going. And and Douthat in the first in the four chapters of part one, the four horsemen, of course, for anything that's negative, we'll have them as horsemen from the book of Revelation. Stagnation, sterility, sclerosis, and repetition. And and you really have to take all those four chapters together. And, and again, I, 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 I very much enjoyed the book, and I'm going through it now a second time. And I knew once I was going through it the first time that I'd want to make some videos about it, because it's right there. And decay is an important word for me. Uh, it was a number of years ago. I was, you know, as a pastor of a struggling, insignificant church, I have time to study the Bible, which is a wonderful thing for a pastor to have time to do. And I was, I was going through, oh, Joel Green, his commentary on the book of, on the book of Luke. Um, I was, I was working through a bunch of other things in the New Testament. And came up with, you know, this phrase, the age of decay. And, and that's the age that we're in because, of course, the Bible tells time in a different way. There's the present evil age. I call it the age of decay. And then there's the age to come or the new age. And in the Gospel of John, for example, the, the, the Greek beneath eternal life in English translations that come downstream from the King James Version Again and again, in the synoptics, you'll see the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. But if you go into the Gospel of John, it's the it's eternal life. And be, the Greek beneath that is the life of the age. And, and again, I've always thought that eternal life, at least in our contemporary lexicon, isn't a great phrase because I think it leads people's imaginations astray. This is the life of the age. That's what Jesus promises that, that you know, for for example, the woman at the well in, in John chapter 4 will well up into eternal life, into the life of the age. It's not just more living. And when you listen to celebrity atheists complain, well, I wouldn't want to go to heaven because it's just more living. Life of the age is at least as much a change of quality of life as a change of duration of life. Okay, And I remember when I first started playing around with this word decay and the age of decay, 1 Corinthians 15, noticing how, you know, Jesus' resurrected body is no longer subject to decay. And if you go to Romans, if you go to Romans 8, that great chapter, you know, you'll talk, you, Paul will talk about decay. And so this is a very important word for Paul is is decay. And the Greeks saw that everything in this world decays. And in a sense, their two worlds mythology, life in the heavens does not decay. And, and of course, you can see some, an association with Platonism in there. In many ways, so many years of my pastoral vocation have been trying to find some magic words to break the American spell. Well, what is the American spell? The American spell is the insinuation, the, the subtle lie that says, if you do everything right, then the kingdom of God will be yours. And and I remember listening to Barack Obama at some point, I don't, I think it was with the with the financial collapse had said, you know, these were people who had done the right thing. Yeah. Well, doing the right thing in this world doesn't necessarily get you the ends and conclusions that you think you want or deserve. The American spell is that 
normal is happy and good and again to borrow from burn powers fun that's that's normal that's what life is supposed to be and if something is intruding intruding into it then well then what it, it's in many ways a, a denial of death and an avoidance of death and that's in very many ways what the American vision is that we've somehow achieved the kingdom of God if you can and there's so many different versions of it if you can go to college and get that career and choose the spouse that you want and 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 then all of this in heaven too just recently of course google knows that i um, read a lot of jordan peterson stuff so when something new pops up and there's not a lot of new lately but whenever something new pops up google will feed it to me and it was really a very good and interesting article written by well, i made the type really small a woman basically and the title of is of it is the feminine case for jordan peterson and i know a lot of jordan peterson fans might not like everything that she has to say in this but i thought i thought i thought it was i thought she she's a very skillful writer and she said some things that i thought were really true and again as a pastor i'm always on the hunt for language because i am looking for those magic words to dispel the american dream or really the american lie Am I radical enough? Am I too? Am I not? Am I not patriotic enough in that? I don't know. We'll see what the comments have to say. She writes this: For many young people, Peterson's message was startling. They had been presented with a woke political narrative that views human suffering as a result of an unequal distribution of power, with those at the top of the hierarchy abusing those at the bottom for their own gain. To me, I thought that was normal. I thought that's what what people do. I'm, I'm a Calvinist. I believe in total depravity. If you only gain power, if only power, if only power could be removed from these people, the story goes, then we could arrive at the kingdom of heaven on earth. And I thought that's exactly that's exactly what woke ideology thinks, and that's exactly why I won't believe it. Because what revolution is 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 bob o'reilly from the who meet the new boss same as the old boss i don't care what color your skin is power corrupts this is what we do our hearts are subject to this read tolkien this is why we can't we can't wield the ring because its corrupting power is too great upon us. And the wise of middle earth like galadriel and and gandalf they won't touch it even though they have tremendous power well, they know because they already understand the seductions of power. You think just because your skin is one color and not another, that somehow the, the seductions of power will not be with you? Yet yet power itself is a gift from God. Read read Andy Crouch's book on powder, on pow on powder, on power. So Peterson's message is startling. I'll read it again. They have been presented a woke political narrative that views human suffering as the result of an unequal distribution of power with those at the top of the hierarchy abusing those at the bottom for their own gain. Yeah, that's what people do. Not always, but often. If only power could be removed from these people, the story goes, then we could arrive at the kingdom of heaven on earth. Peterson says otherwise. Yes, he does. He insists that suffering is our human is the lot as is our lot as human beings and hierarchies are a part um, are an inevitable part of that and Peterson is right but of course I have my differences with Jordan too he, his gospel is a self help gospel meaning is your internal gyroscope and that's true and it's not a bad one. But it's not a perfect one either. Carry that heavy cross up to the top of the hill, to the, the city of God, to the kingdom of God. But, but Peterson himself notes many, many, many times that it's the grasping and the striving by which we feel that meaning, not the attainment. Once we have attained our goal, we're set off for another goal. And, and again, all of that is true. It is in the grasping that experience of meaning is found. 
but is there never attainment? And and we struggle. And that's that's the problem that the that the atheists, the celebrity atheists have with with images of of the life of the age to come. Oh, it sounds boring because there is no challenge. And and this is an, this is an, this is something that is important for us to recognize. And Dante's vision of the beatific vision is, is somehow they can't reach it. They can't see it. They can't know it. Do all holdings do do all holdings decay in this world? Yes, they do. This is the age of decay. As C.S. Lewis said, every love in this world will be broken by death or betrayal. Every corporation, every, every great company you build will be worn down by time and corruption. Every wonderful church that you stand up, O oh church planter, will become an established church and, and, will, be, and, will, and will ossify. This Peterson is right in in a lot of what he sees, but his his open agnosticism struggles to to see the city of God. And I don't think it's it's not it, it's not a problem in necessarily seeing it, but an inability to have a trustful imagination where we could say, this is something I cannot construct because I can't even see it fully but I trust someone who could. Human beings can be amazing fiction writers, but truth remains stranger than fiction, and the realities of this world inspire fiction, but we are, as Tolkien said, always sub-creators. We, we, are not, we cannot create like the master. The, the horizon beyond... We, we don't believe anything that doesn't have a, a horizon, but it's that it's that moreness, it's that thing outside any frame that we conceive that is actually needed for us to believe we are, in fact, alive. So Duthat begins the book, Moon Landing as Pinnacle, the peak of human accomplishment and daring, the greatest single triumph of modern science and government and industry, the most extraordinary endeavor of the American age and modern history occurred in late July in the year 1969. Woodstock was August 1969. When a trio of human beings being cat were catapulted up from the Earth's surface where their fragile sinful species had spent all of its long millennia of conscious history and to stand and walk and leap upon the moon. Now it's very interesting if you look at C.S. Lewis's discarded image and you look at the, the, the medieval model, the moon is somehow the barrier of humanity. And it's striking that we've gotten that far and no further. And, and do thought a number of times in this book, playfully and I think cleverly and creatively ponders whether whether space travel is in fact a a yardstick, an apt yardstick to measure human achievement. Four assassinations later, wrote Norman Mailer of the march of JFK's lunar promise to its Nixon era fulfillment, a war in Vietnam later, a burning of black ghettos later, hippies, drugs, and many student uprisings later, one democratic con convention in Chicago seven years later, one New York school strike later, one sexual revolution later, yes, eight years of dramatic, near catastrophic, outright spooky decade later, we were ready to make the moon. One of the things that will reverberate in Douthat's book is that perhaps we are decadent because we choose so, because finally the striving for greatness is far too costly for us. We were ready, as though the leap into space were linked somehow to the civil rights movement, the baby boomers coming into their own, the transformation in music and manners and mores, and the hope of utopia percolating in Paris, Woodstock, and San Francisco. I'll give you a little taste. It's a good book. A little bit later. 
behind institutions, behind um, constitutional forms and modifications lie the vital force, forces that call these organs into life and shape them to meet changing conditions. The American historian Frederick Jackson Turner wrote those words in 1893, opining on how the idea and reality of the Western frontier shaped American history. The final frontier, Star Trek, again, is space the, the final marker? There is a sense in which Turner's frontier thesis can be usefully applied to the entire modern project whose institutions and forms and bedrock assumptions, the sense of historical mission, the expectation of perpetual progress have been ordered around the permanence of exploration, expansion, and discovery. Again, I go back to Tom Holland's The Invention of Progress as a Christian as a Christian product. In modernity, the former world is always passing away. Again, go look at my last video about kinfolk and identity. The former world is always passing away, the solidity of the past always melting into air. But the promise is that tomorrow will bring something new, that a better life is just a long sea voyage or a wagon train away, that ours is an age of ever unfolding wonders that more than compensate for what's been lost. And I think of the two security guards at the end of the Truman, the Truman Show Finally, when, when, when Truman steps out of Kristoff's world and they cut the signal, what else is on TV? Modernity is too fixed. Modernity is too fixed when we want freedom from place, freedom from self. We want to be ever evolving, but never being kept to our evolution. Don't dead name me. Don't say I was a man and now I am a woman. I've always been a woman. My ever evolving is eternality. I'm always evolving, never being measured. I am in that sense Gnostic. No physicality can capture me. But without place, which is the arena, we lose our we, who is the agent. And we find ourselves with the four horsemen, stagnation, sterility, sclerosis, repetition. Identity is a function of the agent arena relationship. You're not a husband without a marriage. You're not a citizen without a nation state. You're not a parent without a child. You're not a soldier without a war institutions, not just the ones that we can hang signs on, or the ones that paperwork, that create paperwork. Institutions, even the basic ones such as marriage, are fixed points creating subsiding and sub and subsiding identities beneath them. I'm not sure subsiding is the best word. But but we need an arena to have an identity. And we can't, we need each other to know our identity, but we can't actually hold those moments if we ourselves are like some atomic particle way at the end of the periodic table, just here for a fraction of a second and gone. Oh, sure, there's a name. But are all those names at the period at the end of the periodic table dead names? It's interesting how right now in our society the future and the past always seem to come together. Look at look at the uniforms on Star Trek and oh you've got nice diversity going on there. Well, it's it's pretty white, but you've got the you've got Scotty and you've got Chekhov, who's a Russian of course. And you have Uhura, who's from Africa. And you have, why can't I think of, uh, he's the most, he's one of the most famous of them now. Not Spock. Spock is an alien. You've got Nurse Chapel. <laughs> Nurse Chapel. 
And um, the Japanese guy, why can't I think of his name? Oh, crap, I hate when that happens. But look at kinfolk. They're sort of Swedish Mormon shakers. Um, you know, they're... they're they, they come out of the, and remember, the Mormons come out of the same place as the Oneida community and the Jehovah's Witnesses, out of the burned over district. Why? Two great, two great awakenings later, there's nothing left for, for, the, for the Holy Spirit's fire to burn. And the, and the great subtitle of Oneida by Ellen Wayland Smith, if you haven't read that book, you simply must read that book. From Free Love Utopia to a Well-Set Table. can focus sort of in the reverse of it but it's it's cycling right and and decadence is well my stomach is full the fire is set it's too comfortable to go on adventures and then of course gandalf comes knocking and brings a dozen dwarves with him and something stirs within something stirs within bilbo that all the the, the bit of took left within him and he'll leave his, his precious buttons at the closing door of in the Misty Mountains. Decadence is always staying in the hobbit hole. Decadence is the Shire. The heroes, of course, risk everything to try to shave, save and rescue the Shire from Sauron. Look at the evolution of the Klingons. Of course, if you, you watch them in the original, the canonical Star Trek world, they're, they're some sort of Mongols of such, as if we had any real... Do a little bit of reading about the Mongol Empire. Truly amazing empire. But you know how to describe those original Klingons, who, of course, were the sworn enemy of the Federation. And the Klingons now are, are more organic, more Neanderthal. I remember when the next generation Star Trek came out, I started watching it and I abandoned it about the second time I saw the hollow deck and I thought, did I come here for this? This is decadent. Let's keep going back to the roaring 20s. Let's go keep going back to our favorite pastimes. In the original Star Trek, the final frontier, there was no frontier greater. Our, our best days are ahead of us out there, and we can't imagine what's coming. Now it's folks doing their job, and now I, I know I'm going to insult a bunch of you Next Generation fans. I really enjoyed Deep Space Nine. But, you know, is that really the best you could have? decadence what really grabbed me in Duthout's book was his talk about religious decadence and outside those warring camps the big story in western religion is often the absence of interesting stories relevance and interest really interesting the religious center today is the same vague spiritual individualism, the moralistic therapeutic deism blending New Age and Christian elements that writers such as Lausch and Bella once um, first described in the 1970s. Yeah, it's true. What's missing is ferment and experimentation of the kind that yields religious renewal within existing institutions as has happened often within Catholicism and established Protestantism, and yields competitors as well, Mormonism, Christian Science, Jehovah's Witness, the Oneida Community, the Seventh-day Adventist, Pentecostalism, and even, God help us, Jim Jones, David Koresh, and Scientology. Some might argue, Peter Thiel, for example, that even Silicon Valley, no, it's, it's, just, it's just decadent. They don't actually break and disrupt. Everything is ossified into Google and Apple and Amazon. As with other features of decadence, there are advantages in religious mediocrity. Just as the late inhabitants of Jones, just ask the late inhabitants of Jonestown. But the dangers and excesses of cults may be the price of a religious culture may be the price a religious culture pays for innovation, renewal, and spiritual genius. Look at the Protestant Reformation, how bloody it was. We pull back. 
look at the book of Revelation, look at look at what happened in in terms of relationships. Just read read the New Testament and and what's going on. Jesus, of course, doesn't just grow fat and amass around him sycophant disciples who are who are just dripping and waiting for words from the great man's lip. That's not the story of Jesus. When well, Netflix recently aired a documentary called Wild Wild Country, yeah, you should definitely see it, about an Indian guru and his American devotees who tried to build a utopian commune in the high desert of, of, of Oregon 40 years ago, the lunacy of the effort was obvious, but so was its boldness, the yearning for transcendence, and the willingness to believe in a life-changing message and a holy man. There's another one on, on, on Netflix for, about Bikram. You know, watch that one too. And again, it's you see both the, the, the vision of life and then the decadence setting in. Stagnation, sterility, sclerosis, repetition. Eric Weinstein might say rent-seeking. Early Jordan Peterson events had that taste to it. You, you could, and that's probably what drew me right away to it. I, I, I had a, you know, I had a nose for it and you always look for the genuine article. So one of my early conversations, I talked to Sid Helema and we were debriefing. He went to a, a Jordan Peterson event in Hamilton, Ontario. And he, he, I remember him writing to me and talking about, you know, the excitement. There was an excitement in there that, again, Sid is a, Sid is a, Sid is a wonderful man and a, um, you know, a true spiritual leader in the Christian Reformed Church, especially in Ontario, a professor at, at Redeemer College or Redeemer University probably now. And, and I first, Sid first came up on my radar when many of the young pastors coming through the ranks that I respected, I would listen to them and Sid Helema's name would come up again and again. I thought, well, I gotta, gotta meet this guy. But he talked about how going to a Jordan Peterson event, there was that tingle. You had the sense that something was happening. Something was new here. Something was alive here, and I better pay attention to it. It was lost. Maybe we'll see it again. Maybe we we'll won't. Decadence, decay. It was there. It was fresh. Nature's first green is gold. It's her hardest hue to hold. I won't quote it from memory. Nature's first green is gold, her hardest hue to hold. Her early leaf's a flower, but only so an hour. Then leaf subsides to leaf, so Eden sank to grief. So dawn goes down to day, nothing gold can stay. We see it again and again and again. It's decay. It's decadent. I'll keep reading from Duth Douthat's introduction to the book. Mailers was a mystical take on history, but one well suited to its moment for the society that made it happen. The Apollo landings was both a counterpoint to the social chaos of the 1960s and the culmination of a decade's revolutionary promise. It proved that the efficiency and techno-optimism of Eisenhower-era America could persist through the upheavals of the counterculture, and it represented a kind of mystical, dizzy age of Aquarius movement of its own right. Woodstock was billed as an Aquarian event. As much as anything that happened here on Earth, the fire on the moon helped make the summer of 1969 seem like a beginning, not a peak, an opening into a new era in which the frontier would no longer be closed the map no longer filled in. The human beings would expand their explorations, their empires, their arguments and imaginations and ambitions into the very stars. It was the space age which lasted for about 30 years from Sputnik in 1957 to the space shuttle Challenger explosion in 1986. And we who live in its aftermath have forgotten just how confidently it was expected to continue. 
I remember making my little plastic model as a child of the lunar lander and 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 the Apollo missions. I was I was so 19 August 1969, July 1969, I had just turned six years old. And way back in the cobweb memories, I remember sitting down in the front room in our home in front of that in front of that black and white TV that probably somebody had given to my parents because they didn't have money to buy a TV and, and watching those blurry pictures. And I think my parents got me out of bed for it. In the Heavens and the Earth, A Political History of the Space Age, his magisterial narrative of the period, Walter Mc, McDo, McDougall, runs through the expert predictions of the 1960s and 1970s that soon reusable spacecraft would be constantly ascending and descending like angels on Jacob's ladder into space. That by the year 2000, both superpowers would have lunar colonies, I remember growing up watching 1999, the, sh the, the year the moon had an accident and drifted out. It was one of my favorite shows as a kid to watch. That human missions to Mars would begin within a decade of the moon landing. That space would soon become the site of revolutions in energy production, weather control, and more. Likewise, the Apollo era pop culture, 2001, a space odyssey, promised a manned mission to Jupiter in its eponymous year. While the, while the timeline of the future on Star Trek assumed that space exploration and colonization would follow as naturally from the Apollo program as sailors and settlers had followed the course discovered by Columbus. This dream did not quite die with Challenger, but it had lost adherence across the disappointingly earthbound 70s, and from the Reagan era onward, it became a fond and somewhat fantastical hope, invoked as a flourish by presidents seeking to inspire and pursued by the sort of eccentric, um, eccentric billionaires who also invested in cryonics as it became clear that we would not master the vastness of space as easily as explorers crossed the Atlantic, the public's attention waned, political support diminished, and science fiction lost its gee whiz edge and turned dystopian. The movies especially began to treat the infinite spaces differently, as a zone of terrors where no, one's he where no one hears you scream, alien and its, and its imitators, a source of sinister invasions and a home of malignant demigods, the UFO craze and X-Files, or as a purgatory to be escaped by a safe return to Earth, Apollo 13, Gravity, The Martian, Ad Astra, where, where Trek had confidently blended 60s liberalism into the frontier spirit of wagon train. It really was a Western its successive Star Wars and Battleship Galactica were not even visions of the human future at all. They were dispatches from a stellar prehistory, a galaxy long, long time ago. A vision of far away and long ago. In other words, we were a, we were a dead end. We had lost the visions of, although a fallen Eden, in a galaxy far, far away. Meanwhile, unmanned, unmanned space, space flight expanded. Robots reached distant worlds. Astronomers discovered planets that might well be Earth-like, but none of it kindled the popular imagination as the giant leap for mankind had done. For the most part, humanity had decided that whatever might be up there, it would probably remain indefinitely out of reach. This resignation haunts our present civilization across human history. The most dynamic and creative societies have been almost inevitably expansionary, going outwards from tribes and cities and nations to put their stamp upon a large world. Sometimes this has been meant this has meant settlement and sometimes conquest. 
Sometimes it had meant missionary zeal, sometimes simply exploration for the sake of commerce and curiosity. In the case of the modern West, the first world civilization, it meant all of them, God and gold and glory, settler societies and far-flung imperial rule, races to the poles and to the peaks, the spawn of roads and railways and steamship lines and airline routes and communications, networks that bound the world's peripheries into a universal web. Beyond, behind institutions, behind constitutional forms and modifications lie the vital force that calls these organs into life and shapes them to meet changing conditions. He goes into that form more. Again, write the book. There's a, read the book. There's an audio book too. The problem with this definition is that history doesn't work that neatly. Neither the trajectory of morals nor aesthetics yields a simple narrative to rise and fall, and their connections to political strength is likewise highly contingent. Empires can fall at the height of their power and cultural vigor if they face a potent enough enemy, and cultures can give in to appetite, um, appetitive excesses without necessarily seeing their political stability undone. It was more than 400 years from Nero's reign to the actual fall of Rome. But there might be a useful middle ground, a definition of decadence that's neither empty of any judgment nor excessively deterministic. That definition would follow in the footsteps of the great cultural critic Jacques Barzun, who began his massive survey of Western cultural history titled, of course, From Dawn to Decadence, by passing a clinical judgment on our own era. And so this is a block quote. Borrowing, large, borrowing widely from other lands, thriving on dissent and originality, the, rest has, the West has been the mongrel civilization par excellence. But in spite of patchwork and conflict, it has pursued characteristic purposes. That is its unity. And now these purposes carried out to their utmost possibility are bringing about its demise. This sense of an ending, Barzun goes on, need not mean stoppage or total ruin, and this will be crucial to my own argument in this book, that for all its association with decay and decline, a society can be, can be decadent without necessarily being poised for any kind of collapse. All that is meant by decadence is falling off. It applies in those, it applies in those who live in such a time no loss of energy or talent or moral sense. On the contrary, it is a very active time, full of deep concerns, but particularly rest, but peculiarly restless, for it sees no clear lines of advance. The forms of art as of life seem exhausted. The stage of development has been run through. Institutions function painfully. Rep, um, repetition and, and frustration are the intolerable result. Boredom and fatigue are the great historical forces. It will be added, how does the historian know when decadence sets in? By the open confession of malaise. When people accept futility and the absurd as normal, the culture is decadent. The term is not a slur, it is a technical label. The decadent society is, by definition, a victim of its own significant success. Eric Weinstein did an interesting podcast, his most recent portal, I think, while well, I'm saying that, depending on when you watch this one, about the Veritas Project. It was a very interesting conversation. Eric wanted, I forget the guy's name, to focus on institutions more than people. Douthat does this. But really it narrows things um, now. All of this, both Barzun's meditation and my own attempted definition, may it sound impossibly vague, isn't sclerosis in the eyes of the beholder? Who decides what constitutes the absurd? But really it narrows things in quite, really it narrows things in quite useful ways. First, Emphasizing the economic element limits the scope of decadence to societies that are actually stagnating 
in a measurable way and frees us from the habit of just associating decadence with anything we dislike in rich societies or in any age. Gilded jazz of luxury, corruption, and excess, emphasizing the decay of institutions likewise, frees us from the trap of regarding an individual case, whether a Nero or a Bill Clinton or a Donald Trump, as a sink, I can never say that word out loud, um, as, as a synecdoche for a civilization as a whole, focusing on repetition in the culture. An intellectual realm frees us as well a bit from the problems of individual intellectual and aesthetic taste that lightens the obligation of deciding exactly which literary taste or intellectual shift constitutes the tipping point into decadence. In each case, the goal is to define decadence as something more specific than just any social or moral trend that you dislike. A society that generates a lot of bad movies need not be decadent. A society that just makes the same movies over and over again might be. A society run by the cruel and arrogant might not be decadent. A society where even the wise and the good can't legislate might be. A poor or crime-ridden society isn't necessarily decadent. A society that's rich and peaceable, but exhausted, depressed, I would add meaningless, striven with a, with a, a massive meaning crisis, and beset by flares of nihilistic violence, looks closer to our definition. The truth of America and the West in the first decades of the 21st century, a truth that helped us, that helped give us the Trump presidency, but will still be an important truth when he is gone, is that we have not been hurting ourselves, we have not been hurtling anywhere except maybe in a circle. Instead, we are aging, comfortable, and stuck, cut off from the past, and no longer optimistic about the future spurning both memory and ambition while we wait some while we await some saving innovation or revelation burrowing into cocoons from which no chrysalis is likely to emerge growing old unhappily together in the light of tiny screens if this isn't a vision of someone living in their parents basement doing porn video games covered with cheetos dust that jordan peterson likes to talk about i don't know what is what fascinates and terrifies us about the Roman Empire is not that it finally went smash, wrote W.H. Auden in the last world um, of the last world empire in its endless autumn, but rather it managed to last four centuries without creating warmth, without creativity, warmth, or hope. There was nothing left that could conquer Rome, G.K. Chesterton wrote on the same theme, but there was also nothing left that could improve it. It was the end of the world, and the worst of it was that it need never end. Whether we are waiting for Christians or barbarians, a renaissance or a singularity, the dilemma that Auden and Chesterton describes is now not Rome's, but ours. And he goes into the four horsemen. And he gives a couple of different illustrations the first of which, the fire Festival. A young man comes to New York City. He's a striver, 2015. He's a striver, a hustler, working the borderlands between entrepreneurship and con artistry, drumming up investment for his projects without being completely honest about his financial prospects. His first effort, a special credit card for affluent millennials, gets attention disproportionate to its profitability and yanks him into the celebrity economy where he meets an, ambition, an ambitious rapper businessman. Together they plan a new company, a kind of internet brokerage, where celebrities can sell their mere presence to the highest bidder. As a brand enhancing achievement for the company, he decides to leverage their connection to a host of major to host a major music festival, an exclusive expensive affair on a Caribbean island that will be the must get ticket for influencers, festival obsessives, and the youthful rich. The festival's online rollout is a great success. 
There's a viral video of supermodels and Instagram celebrities frolicking on a deserted beach, a sleek website for consumers and, and the curious, and soon people are dropping down substantial, even obscene amounts of lux um, on luxurious festival packages, the kind that promise not just backstage access, but also a private cabana on the beach. In the end, about 8,000 people buy tickets at an average cost of $2,500 to $4,000. Tens of millions of dollars, the superfluity of a rich society, yours for the right sales pitch. But the festival as pitched does not exist. Instead, our entrepreneurs' big plans collapse one by one. The private island can't hold the crowds. The local government doesn't cooperate. Even after all the ticket sales, the money isn't there, and the time definitely isn't. And he has to keep talking new investors into bailing out the old ones and inventing new amenities to sell to ticket buyers to pay for the ones they've already purchased. It's a Ponzi scheme with, into, with Instagram flash. He does it... Um, he does have a team, exhausted and impressively driven, working around the clock ready, something for something for their paying customers, but what he actually but they actually offer in the end is a sea of FEMA tents vaguely near a beach, a sound stage that doesn't work, a catering concern that supplies slim slim uh, slimy sandwiches and a lot of cheap tequila. Amazingly, the people actually come, bright young things Instagramming their way to the experience of a lifetime, only to have their photo streams and their video feeds become a hilarious chronicle of dashed expectations. The tent city ruined by an unexpected rainstorm, the spoiled life giving way to drunken anarchy, and the failed entrepreneur trying to keep order with a bullhorn before the absconding to New York, where he finds disgrace, arrest, prison, and an, inev and an inevitable Netflix documentary. That's the story of Billy McFarland and the Fire Festival. It's a small-time story. The next one is bigger. And then he goes to... Well, I'll save it for another video. But watch it on Netflix. You can find right now on Netflix. I guess I'm honking Netflix. You know, Freddy, where's Freddy? Send me a Netflix endorsement. Send the money. Instagram me, baby. You can watch the um, the Fire Festival document on Netflix and then just hop over to the Woodstock one. In a moment in the Fire Festival documentary, the... <laughs> The guy who was supposed to be adult supervision, who, because he was a gay man, Billy McFarland pleaded with him to supply a, a, a tax officer in the government of the Bahamas a blowjob in order to get their water supply past customs. This was the guy who was old enough to say, I kept going along with it because maybe it would be a Woodstock. Watch the PBS series on Woodstock. Sure, it's a lot of hag boomer hagiography, but I'll tell you, the difference between the Fire Festival and Woodstock is amazing. And it screams decadence. So, of course, I'm reading DeThought's book and I'm chasing down citations and such, which draws me to G.K. Chesterton's Everlasting Man because in many ways, Douthat is, is getting a lot of his stuff from Chesterton. Jonathan Peugeot has had this very interesting idea, and I first heard it from him, of this seeming resurrection of, of Christianity, that, that Christianity just keeps resurrecting itself. And, and in Jonathan Peugeot's symbolic world we reach a point of inversion and then we christianity somehow morphs into a new thing which is which is actually the old thing and that's why i said to to craig reed i said you know jonathan peugeot is fresh because not because he's new but because he's he's very very old not as a person, but because he's an artist and he, he has learned the ways of symbolism, of ancient symbolism, and that's the eye that he looks at and interprets our culture. And people find it and say, this is so dramatically new. Yeah, because it's so 
astoundingly old. The final chapter of G.K. Chesterton's The Everlasting Man before the conclusion of the book is entitled The Five Deaths of the Faith. Chesterton writes, It is not the purpose of this book to trace the subsequent history of Christianity, especially the latter history of Christianity, which involves controversies of which I hope to write more fully elsewhere. It is devoted only to the suggestion that Christianity, appearing amid heathen humanity, had all the character of a unique thing. It was that tingly that we long for. It was that, it was that, horizon, that border between the finite and the infinite, that unless we can sense it's out there, can't really believe in what we're looking at. It is devoted only to the suggestion that Christianity appearing amid heathen humanity had all the character of a unique thing and even of a supernatural thing. It was not like any of the other things, and the more we study it, the less it looks like any of them. But there is a rather peculiar character which marked it henceforth, even down to the present moment, with a note on which this book may well conclude. I have said that Asia and the ancient world had an air of being too old to die. Christianity has had the very opposite fate. Christendom has had a series of revolutions, and in each one... And in each one of them, Christianity has died. Christianity has died many times and risen again. For it had a God who knew the way out of the grave. Oh, Chesterton is so good. But the first extraordinary fact which marks this history is this, that Europe had been turned upside down over and over again. And that at the end of each of these revolutions, the same religion has again been found on top. The faith has always converted the age, not as an old religion, but as a new religion. This truth is hidden from many by a convention that is too little noticed. Curiously enough, it is a convention of the sort which those who ignore it claim especially to detect and denounce. They are always telling us that priests and ceremonies are not religion. Woodstock was not religious. Fire Festival was not religious. Sam Harris is not religious. Matt Dillahunty is not religious. They're all exceedingly religious. At the end of the at the end of the Brett Weinstein Alistair McGrath talk, Alistair Riley leans over and says, "Almost sounds like you're asking for a new religion." We religious people, we recognize it because we live within it. When I saw the woke arise, I thought, this is a new Calvinism. My goodness. They are always telling us that priests and ceremonies are not religion and that religious organizations can be a hollow sham, as if we don't know this. But they hardly realize how true it is. It is so true that three or four times, at least in the history of Christendom, the whole soul seems to have gone out of Christianity, and almost every man in his heart expects it to end. This fact is only masked in medieval and other times by that very official religion which such critics pride themselves as seeing through. In other words, the edifice of the church remains, and so Christianity didn't die because they're the church. Remain still, with plenty of its hollow edifices. The fact is only masked in medieval and other times that by that very official religion which such critics pride themselves as seeing through, Christianity remained the official religion of a Renaissance prince or the official religion of an 18th century bishop, just as an ancient mythology remained the official religion of Julius Caesar, or the Arian Creed long remained the official religion of Julian the Apostate. But there was a difference between the cases of Julius and Julian, because the church had begun its strange career. There was no reason why men like Julius should not worship gods like Jupiter forever in public and laugh at them even in private. Just read Plato's Republic. It's fascinating. The gods, and now and then, God. Where did that singular come from, Mr. Plato? 
But when Julian treated Christianity as dead, he found it had come to life again. He also found, incidentally, that there was not the faintest sign of Jupiter ever coming to life again. No Sam, no Richard, Zeus and the Lord are two very different concepts, two very different ideas, descriptions of two very different realities, more real than anything or imagined. This case of Julian and the episode of, Ar of, of Arianism is but the first of a series of examples that can only be roughly indicated here. And then he goes on to indicate them. Uh, maybe I'll read a little bit of this one. Arianism, as it had been said, had every human appearance of, of, of being the natural way in which a particular superstition of Constantine might be expected to peter out. All the ordinary stages had been passed through. The creed had become a respectable thing. It had become a ritual thing. It had been modified into a rational thing. And the rationalists were ready to dissipate the last remains of it, just as they do today. Notice, notice Chesterton's cycle of rationality, that it's in fact the religious that gives birth to the rational. And could this in very real terms be what that young man at the meetup in Bellflower was noticing? That if it's the religious that gives birth to the rational, then if you're going to get beyond the rationality that is ossified in people that can learn no more, even sitting across the stage from two other brilliant people like Jordan Peterson and, 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 and Brett Weinstein, well... There can be no more new rationality because there's no more religion to birth it. When Christianity rose again suddenly and through them, it was almost as unexpected as Christ rising from the dead. But there are many other examples of the same thing. Even about the same time, the rush of missionaries from Ireland, for example, has all the air of an unexpected onslaught of young men in an old world. Or even on a, I think in many ways, that's, that's sort of what horrified people about the Jordan Peterson phenomenon. It was a rush of young men in a very old world. Some of them were martyred on the coast of, Storm, Stonewall, of Cornwall, and the chief authority on, on Cornish antiquities told me that he did not believe for a moment that they were martyred by heathens, but as he expressed it with some humor, by rather slack Christians. You know, the sack of Rome was done by barbarians. It wasn't until not that long ago that reading enough history, I said, those barbarian were Aryan Christians and they just destroyed the pagans. Of course the pagans complained. That's why Augustine had to rise. Now, if we were to dip below the surface of history, isn't that what we're talking about? behind the surface this that that do thought is doubt it is trying to get at it is not in the scope of this are um, it is, as it is not in the scope of this argument too I suspect that we should find several occasions where Christendom has thus to all appearance hollowed out from within by doubt and indifference indifference is really what doubt it is talking about so that only the old Christians, I spit on the screen. You could get COVID from my screen. Now, if we were to dip below the surface of history, it is not in the scope of this argument to do. I suspect that we would find several occasions where Christendom was thus to an, to an appearance hollowed out from within by doubt and indifference, so that only the old Christian shell stood as the pagan shell had stood so long. But the difference is that in every case, the sons were fanatical for the faith where the fathers had been slack about it. This is obvious in the case of the transition from the Renaissance to the Counter-Reformation. It is obvious in the case of a transition from the 18th century to many Catholic revivals of our times. But I suspect many other examples which would be worthy of separate studies. The faith, capital F, is not a survival. 
It is not as if Druids had managed somehow to, divide, to survive somewhere from 2,000 years. It was that it was what might have been it was what might have happened in Asia or ancient Europe and that indifference or intolerance in which mythologies and philosophies could live forever side by side. It was not survive, it has not survived. It has returned again and again in this Western world of rapid change and institutions perpetually perishing. We keep decaying. Nature's first green is gold, her hardest hue to hold. Europe, in the tradition of Rome, was always trying revolution and reconstruction, rebuilding a universal republic. And it always began to reject this old stone and ended up by making it by making it the head of the corner. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that's a biblical reference to Christ. By bringing it back from the rubbish heap to make it the crown of the capital. Some stones of Stonehenge are standing, and some have fallen. And as the stone falleth, so shall it lie. There has not been a druidic renaissance um, there has not been a druidic renaissance every century or two. Some might argue we're having one now. We'll see where it goes. With the young druids crowned with fresh mistletoe, dancing in the sun at Salisbury Plain, Stonehenge has not been rebuilt in, in every style of architecture from rune down from rude round Norman to the last Rococo of the Baroque. The sacred place of the druids is safe from vandalism, is safe from the vandalism of restoration. Watch the fight over Notre Dame. But the church in the West was not a world where things were too old to die, but in, but in one in which they were always young enough to be killed. The consequence was that superficially and externally it often did get killed. Nay, it sometimes wore out even without getting killed. And there follows a fact in which something, dif um, a fact I find somewhat difficult to describe, yet which I believe to the very real and ra to be very real and rather important. As a ghost is the shadow of a man, and in that sense the shadow of life, so at intervals there passes across this endless life a sort of shadow of death. It came at the moment when it would have perished had it been perishable. It withered away everything that is perishable. This is the same decadence that Douthat is talking about. If such animal parallels were worthy of the occasion, we might say that the snake shuddered and shed a skin and went on, or even the cat went into convulsions as it lost only one of its 999 lives. It is truer to say in a more dignified image that a clock struck and nothing happened, or that a bell tolled for an execution that was everlastingly postponed. What was the meaning of all that dim but vast unrest of the 12th century, when, as it, as it has been so finely said, Julian stirred in his sleep? Why did there appear so strangely early in the twilight of a dawn after the dark ages so deep a skepticism as that involved in urging nominalism again so deep a skepticism as that involved in urging nominalism against realism. For realism against nominalism was really realism against rationalism, or something more destructive that had been called rationalism. The answer is that just as, might, just as some might have thought the church simply a part of the Roman Empire, so others might have thought the church only a part of the Dark Ages, the Dark Ages ended as the Empire had ended, and the Church should have departed with them. But she had been almost one of the shades of night. It was another of those spectral deaths or simulations of a confession that Christianity had failed. For nominalism is a far more fundamental skepticism than mere atheism. Such was the question that was openly asked in the dark age as the dark ages broadened into what daylight that into that daylight that we call the modern world but what was the answer the answer was aquinas on the chair of aristotle taking all knowledge of his province and tens of thousands of lads 
down to the lowest rank of peasant and serf, living in rags and on crusts about the great colleges to listen to scholastic philosophy. Yeah, Chesterton has some pretty particular ideas about the Protestant Reformation and Calvinism, which we won't go into. But on and on he goes about this. Ah. My highlights, which mark my readings, didn't transfer from one computer to the other. Fixed with a refresh. But all these cases are remote in date and could only be proved in detail. We can see the fact much more clearly in the case when, pri when paganism of the Renaissance ended, Christianity and Christianity unaccountably began all over again. But we can see it most clearly in all, um, of all in the case which is close to us and full of manifest and minute evidence. This is Chesterton writing in the 1920s. The case of the great decline of religion that began around the time of Voltaire, for indeed, if it is our own case, and we ourselves have seen the decline of that decline, the 200 years since Voltaire did not flash past us at a glance, like, a fourth, like the 4th or the 5th centuries, or the 12th or the 13th centuries. In our case, we can see this oft-repeated process close at hand. We know how completely a society can lose its fundamental religion without abolishing its official religion. We know how men can can all become agnostics long before they have abolished bishops. And we know that also in this last ending, we really do look to us like that, which really did look to us like a final ending. The incredible thing has happened again. The faith has been following along the... Um, following among the young men, faith has been following among the young men than among the old. When Ibsen spoke of the new generation knocking at the door, he certainly never expected that would it would be the church door. At least five times at least five times therefore, with the Arian and the Alb and the Albigensian, with the humanist skeptic after Voltaire and after Darwin, the faith has all appeared, <laughs> the faith has, has to all appearances gone to the dogs. In each of these cases, it was the dog that died. <laughs> how complete was the collapse and how strange the reversal. We can only see in detail in the case nearest to our own time. A thousand things have been said about the Oxford movement, about the parallel French Catholic revival, but few have made us feel the simplest fact about it, that it was a surprise. This was Jordan Peterson. It was a surprise. A 12-step programs to many. They're a surprise. And suddenly at the end of the 12-step program, just like many people at the end of Jordan Peterson discover, I think I feel like a Christian. Where could that a feeling have come from? It was a puzzle as well as a surprise because it seemed to most people like a river turning backwards from the sea and turning to climb back into the mountains. That's what the Jordan Peterson thing looked to me. It was like a river turning backwards. And I thought, what's with this moment? To have read the literature of the 18th and 19th century is to know that nearly everyone had come to take it for granted that religion was a thing that would continually broaden like a river. I still hear that today till it reaches an infinite sea. Some of them expected it would go down a cataract of catastrophe. Most of them expected it to widen into an estuary of equality and moderation. Decadence. But all of them thought it returning to itself a prodigy as incredible as witchcraft. In other words, the most moderate people thought that faith, like freedom, would be slowly broadening down, and some advanced people, though it would be very rapidly broadening down, not to say flattened out. All that world of Gizot and, and, and Macaulay and the commercial and scientific liberality was perhaps more certain than any men before it, or certain about the, about the direction in which the world is going. People were so certain about that direction that they only differed about the place, about the pace. That's exactly right. What today is more 
universally embrace then this arc of history, then the right side of history, that we all seem to know exactly what that is until a disturbance like Jordan Peterson or the Azusa Street Mission or Pentecostalism or an, an epidemic arises and suddenly history isn't flowing in the way we thought it should flow. In short, the whole world being divided about whether the stream was going slower or faster became conscious of something vague but vast that was going against the stream. Both in fact and figure, there was something deeply disturbing about it, and that for an, and, and that for an essential reason. A dead thing can go with the stream, but only a living thing can go against it. A dead dog can be lifted to the leaping water with all the swiftness of a leaping hound, but only a live dog can swim backwards. A paper boat can ride the, the rising deluge with all the airy arrogance of a fairy ship. But if the fairy ship sails upstream, it really, it really is rowed by fairies. And among the things that merely went to the tide of the apparent progress and enlargement, there was many a demagogue or a sophist whose wild gestures were, in truth, as lifeless as the movement of a dead dog's limbs waving in the eddying water, and many of a philosophy uncommonly like a paper boat of the sort that is not difficult to knock into a cocked hat. But even the truly living and even the life-giving things that went with the stream did not thereby prove that they were living or life-giving. It was the other force that unquestionably and unaccountably alive. Alive. Notice how often this definition of life comes back to bother us. There's a video that's been waiting in my mind. Maybe it'll come to the surface. It was this other force that was unquestioningly and unaccountably alive. The mysterious and unmeasured energy that was thrusting back the river that was felt to be like the movement of some great monster. It was nonetheless clearly a living monster because most people thought it a prehistoric monster. It was nonetheless an unnatural and an incongruous, and to some a cosmic upheaval, as if the great sea serpent had suddenly risen out of the round pond. Unless we considered the sea serpent as more likely to live in the serpentine, this flippant element in the fantasy must not be missed, for it was one of the clearest testimonies to the unexpected nature of the reversal. That age did really feel I've got to keep my eye on the time. That age did really feel like a preposterous quality in prehistoric animals belong to a historic rituals. It's very interesting. Find the tweet about this cat thought near extinct roaming through the empty streets of India. This world is still puzzled by that movement, but most of all because it still moves. I have said something elsewhere to the rather random sort of reproaches that are still directed against it and its much greater consequences. It is enough to say that the more such critics reproach it, the less they explain it. In a sense, it is my concern here, if not to explain it, at least to suggest the direction of an explanation. But above all, it is my concern to point out one particular thing about it, and that is that it had all happened before, and even many times before. These are the people who say they wish Christianity to remain a ghost. They mean, very literally, that they wish it to remain a goat, to remain a... Oh, I misread it. There are people who, who say they wish Christianity to remain a spirit. They mean very literally they wish, to, they wish it to remain a ghost, but it is not going to remain a ghost. What follows this process of apparent death is not the lingering of the shade, it is the resurrection of the body. These people are quite prepared to shed pious and reverent tears over the sepulcher of the Son of Man. What they are not prepared for is the Son of God walking once more upon the hills of the morning. These people, and indeed most people, were indeed by the time quite accustomed to the idea that the old Christian candlelight would fade into the light of common day. To many of them, it did quite honestly appear like that 
pale yellow flame of a candle when it was left burning in the sunlight. It was all the more unexpected and therefore all the more unex un unmistakable that the 17 branch candlestick suddenly towered to heaven like a miraculous tree and flamed until the sun turned pale. But other ages have seen the day conquer the candlelight and then the candlelight conquer that day. Again and again before our time, men have grown confident with deluded doctrine. And again and again, there has followed onto that delusion, coming out of the darkness in a crimson cataract, the strength of the red original wine. And we only say once more, together, as has been said many times by our fathers, long years and centuries ago, our fathers and the founders of our people drank as they dreamed of the blood of God. Long years and centuries have passed since the strength of that giant, vin of that giant vintage has been anything but a legend of the age of giants. Centuries ago, already the dark time of the second firmament fermentation when the wine of Catholicism turned into the vinegar of Calvinism. Long since that bitter drink had been itself diluted, rinsed out and washed away by the waters of oblivion that the wave of the, um, uh, waters of oblivion and the wave of the world. Never did we think to taste again even that bitter tang of sincerity and the spirit still less the richer and the sweeter strength of the purple vineyards in our dreams of the age of gold. Nature's first green is gold, her hardest hue to hold. Day by day and year by year, we have lowered our hopes and lessened our convictions. We have grown more and more used to seeing those vats and vineyards overwhelmed by the water floods and the last savior and suggestion of that special element fading like a stain of purple upon a sea of gray. We have grown used to dilution and dissolution and to a watering down that went on forever. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. John chapter 2. This is the final act, and it is the most extraordinary of all. The faith has not only died, but has also died of old age. It has not only been often killed, but has often died a natural death, in the sense of coming to a natural and necessary end. It is obvious that it has survived the most savage and the most universal persecutions, from the shock of Di the Diocletian fury to the shock of the French Revolution, and I would add to the shock of the Soviet era, and it emerges in Russia and in many places around the world as it is emerging in China today. It was a more strange and even more weird tenacity. It has survived not only war, but peace. It has not only died often, but degenerated often and decayed often. It has survived its own weakness and even its own surrender. We need not repeat what is so obvious about the beauty of the end of Christ in its, in its wedding of youth and death. But it's almost as if Christ had lived to the last possible span and had been white-haired sage of hundreds and died of natural decay and then had risen again rejuvenated with trumpets and the rending of the sky. I don't think it's the case that Jonathan is too bold. He perhaps is too meek. And then a pandemic comes. And, well, maybe it'll be a light one. Maybe the economic catastrophe will be worse. I don't know. I don't know the future. Previous generations struggled. It's been interesting reading Douthat's book now. Because stagnation? What do we want? Well, as long as the checks keep coming from the employer or the government, I can just keep watching Netflix. Wouldn't it be nice to get that drip of Soma as in Brave New World and just let life glide by? Let our lives decay? This is the age of decay. I sit before you, a man in his mid-50s, decaying at a rapid rate, the pandemic coming through, wiping out seniors. Woe be to you who are in a nice nursing home. That's where the Grim Reaper calls. 
Previous generations struggle to recognize the resurrected Lord until he speaks our name, until he eats a fish, until he shows up and says, were you talking about me? Did you forget about me? Did you think walls can hold me? We ask, now will, the re now will you restore the kingdom to Israel? It's not for you to know the times and the place set by the Father, but you will receive power and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Samaria, in China and Russia, in Africa and Asia. You will be my witnesses and you will often get me wrong. You will sometimes, you will sometimes commit sins of omission, but perhaps you would rather have us commit those sins than the or sins of of commission rather than omission because in our decadent society we just get on the heroin and slip into death i've been by enough hospital deathbeds is this the age of our decadence will decadence survive the pandemic i don't know but chesterton's idea Christianity keeps coming back. We live these tiny little lives. We're in cycles of centuries. We do such tiny little things. Nature's first green is gold, her hardest hue to hold. Were you will your hue be gold?